this. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do soon wither like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the law of the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. For evil men will be cut off. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Let's go to the Lord today. Lord, today we come here on this Sunday, the first Sunday in June. It's warm outside. The sun is shining. But perhaps we come here today, we're exhausted. We're exhausted from all the activities uh, and the things that we're going to do. Today, may we rest in you and wait patiently for your will to work out in our lives as we take up our cross and follow Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for walking beside us and in us. Amen. Let's worship the Lord today. as You know, we live in a world where Christ is not popular. More than 200 million Christians today live in places where persecution happens. 200 million. Korea, China, Afghanistan, Asia, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Burma, and yet they're brothers and sisters. We live so well in this country of ours where we have been in many ways spared and buffered. Sometimes I think it's like a hammock that's being Moved by Satan, saying, just relax, you'll be all right. Nothing's going to hurt you. Just lay low. Pretend that everything's all right. And the rocking continues. Now I know that uh, there's a lot of other concerns. People that are grieving. Places where cancer comes to call. Corruption. Addiction. Temptations that we all face. Loved ones that we're praying for. REC, we need to keep in our prayers all of those residents that already went through and the challenges that they face when they get out. We got Vacation Bible School just around the corner. So let's remember 
that day, that Saturday. The Lord would raise up a group of kids that want to learn about Jesus and His love. Workers that are willing to show and share that love. And let's see what the Lord can do. Let's go to the Lord right now today. And ask Him, invite Him, whatever issues we have. Let's go right now. <laughs> if you had a great big ice pack, Lord, today, you would put it on the globe. Because the whole world is hurting. There's hunger and thirst and greed and wickedness and government corruption everywhere. And Lord, we have our issues too. There are our griefs that we have, our anguishes over loved ones that are so close, whose lives are in the hands of liquor, drugs, and other temptations. And we talk and we're shut out and slammed out, locked out. And we're helpless and hopeless. Or maybe we're locked in. Locked into the situation. We have no choice. Because cancer has come to call. Physical ailments, pains and aches that won't go away, that keep us up at night and cause our ability to move around to be minimal. And yes, there is all of our situations. We face a summer of heat. We face a summer of a lot of things going on and school's out. Figuring out what to do with our time. Be with us as we try to prepare for Bible school. We pray that you would fill this place with kids that have a desire. Maybe for something they don't even know what it is. But it's a hunger to be you, with you to know about you and love you. Lord, we pray, not only for those kids, but for those workers, for those lessons, for those projects, for those activities that are planned. For may the unplanned happen. We pray for REC, Lord, that still is so important. Move in the lives of of the jail, the jailer, the sheriff's department, and all the guards. Provide those volunteers that will be there for the weekly visits, relationships that are developed, and resources that are passed along. And we pray for our county fair that is also right around the corner where everybody in Decatur County is going to come here in just a few short weeks to be together. Provide. Provide, Lord. Provide for your power. Provide for your witness. Provide for our church as we take our place. Be with this neighborhood, Lord. You know the needs that are here, the challenges, 
the climbs. You know what is behind closed doors. You know what needs to be exposed to the light and the love where it needs to shine the most. Help us to be that wrecking ball for the walls of Satan that can restrict and try to lock out what your love wants to do. Amen and amen. Turning your Bibles or listen as we read together these words from Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading verses 8 through 15 and then 51 to 59. Let's read, let's listen together. Now, Stephen. A man full of God's grace and power did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin and produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, 
and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And going to chapter 7, beginning with verses 51 to 59. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persuade or persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You, you, are, you who have received the law that it was put into effect through the angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voice, they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading. In this series, we're talking about the energized. We looked last week at Peter, who spoke at Pentecost. You might say that was the birthday of the church. And 3,000 people become believers after they hear what Peter has to say. It also says at the end of the chapter, that the church was growing daily. And after Acts chapter 4 and 5, it says another 5,000 are added to the original three, plus the daily growth. Exponential growth that takes place from Pentecost until this particular situation right now. We're going to come face to face by the name of Stephen. Now, Stephen's name basically means victor's crown. Now, he got this name from his parents. Victor's crown is the meaning of his name. What I know is that in the second century A.D., a man by the name of Tertullian. One of the things he coined the term about is, it seems like the blood of the martyrs is the seeds of the church. The blood of the martyrs are the seeds of the church. There are some things that happen when Stephen is nominated to be a deacon in the church, and actually began to be a witness, like we all are supposed to be, that has a lot of things that began to happen. It's what's going to happen with Philip next week we're going to read about. It's what's going to happen in a couple of weeks when we look at Saul of Tarsus. It's what causes this mass persecution and Christians that are scattered across the face of the Roman Empire. The blood of the martyrs are the seeds of the church. Now many, many years ago, when our daughter was in middle school, um, I volunteered to be a cabin leader at Westport Camp. And we brought about 11 kids about the same age to junior high camp at Westport, Indiana. And the approach of camp is to prepare those junior high kids to go back into their communities, their schools, their churches, and sort of ignite things. 
Now the first day, just sort of uh, help them to kind of get acclimated to church camp. So it's all about getting ready to getting excited with the, with the cabins and, and the news that nature brings and, and all the challenges of being with people you've maybe never met before. And, and then there's chapel three times a day and arts and crafts, but everything is Jesus. Even the food and the dining hall, it's all about Jesus. And in those days, we didn't have cell phones we had to deal with. They had to Leave them at home. Didn't have TVs. Didn't, we might have had a radio or two. But all the things that would distract them at home were not there. And our approach was the idea of boldness. We had this young kid who was dynamic and talented. He played the guitar. He sang. He was skinny as a rail. He had this black curly hair. And he stood up there with the praise team. And he bellowed out these choruses and led these kids to believe they could change their world. His name was James. Now, I met James numerous times. But at that camp, I met him two years in a row playing his guitar and singing his heart out. He ended up being a praise and worship leader at, at a big mega church in Columbus. Now he's gone on to other things. But he's still singing and praising the Lord. But one of the things that he led these kids is in the words of Romans 16, verses 19 and 20. Where it says, be wise about what is good and be innocent about what is evil. And you will crush Satan underneath your feet. Now that sounds like a crazy course to get things started up. Be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. And God will cause you to crush Satan underneath your feet. What a praise chorus for those kids to carry home in broken homes, troubled schools, challenged lives, dead churches, and make things happen. But we live in an age where it seems like there is this appalling attitude that followers of Jesus have that says we need to blend in. We need to just relax and be respectable and just not cause too much trouble so that Satan doesn't bother us anymore. Pretend we're not here. Let us just go to our churches and do our thing and Everything will be fine. What do we do about those two million Christians around the world really live in areas where it's against the law to be a Christian? The underground church in China that is exploding exponentially and it's illegal to be a church in China. What do we do about little kids in Burma when Buddhist extremists many years ago shot a rocket-powered grenade into hospitals and orphanages to destroy them to pieces. What do we do about those great-grandparents whose great-great-grandchildren paid the price in North Korea because their loved ones accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, began to teach it in the homes. What do we do in places in the world, a Muslim world, where there's people that are beaten and burned, little girls that are terrorized and abused because the Muslims have decreed that they're followers of Jesus, they're infidels. What do we do about the little girl from Indonesia 
who a jihadist literally put his pistol into her mouth when she refused to deny Jesus as her Savior and Lord. And he pulled the trigger and he says, God won't help you with this. She survived. She's disfigured for the rest of her life. But she survived. What do we do with that? We live here. We think it's safe. Until we realize the hatred that does happen. In mall shootings. Hatred that happens. By those who absolutely hate Christians for what they stand for. We're living in an age where a bullet could take us out because we stand with Jesus. What do we do about the realities, the fears that we might have of being incarcerated? Because increasingly hate speech is twisted and turned to what is good is labeled as evil and what is evil is labeled as good. And speaking out about abortion and homosexuality, what makes a real family and marriage is hate speech. What do we do about the fact that confiscations can be taken care of, and taken from us. What in the world is going to happen when this bill that was passed that raised the debt limit and there's $20 billion set aside for new IRS agents? What's going to keep them busy? Are they going to be targeting us? Christians, churches, tax-exempt statuses? or separation from our loved ones. We saw what happened during the pandemic. How people were banned from going into nursing homes and hospitals where their loved ones were dying. But the government said, we're going to shut everything down. You can't have visitors. You can't go to see your loved ones. It doesn't matter. We've got to be safe. What are we going to do in the face of these kinds of things? But enters today this man by the name of Stephen, whose, let's just say, his speech, his address, brings us face to face with bloodshed. Remember, his name means victor's crown. He is a witness. The very word in Greek for witness also means a martyr. When we confess Christ to be our Savior and Lord, it means we have crucified ourselves and our past. And we're raised to walk in a newness of life. Which means we are, we've got a label, a target on our back. So we have this passage. Again, in chapter 6, what we have is Stephen. And it says, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. This is Stephen. This is the deacon. The man that was spirit and wisdom, who had a great rapport with people, who was going around, he's doing great and wonderful things, People are hearing the good news of Jesus Christ and things are moving forward. But then, the ball is hit. And there comes this debate with this synagogue of the freedmen. Now, this synagogue of the freedmen, understand a Jewish synagogue can be made anytime there was ten Jewish men in an area, and they could support it. Now, these are not Judean synagogue. These are people from all over the Roman world. Many of them have been captors of Rome and prisoners, 
but they've been brought together under the umbrella. They're Jews, but they're not from Judea. They're Greek-speaking Jews, but they reside in and around the area. And they're there, of course, for Pentecost. But they began to debate with Stephen. They began to push back. They are the Antichrist, if you will. And as they began to debate with him, they're not able to handle him. They're not able to handle his wisdom, his insight into this Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this meant they re realized these are some of the same people and they have some of the same tactics as those that arrested Jesus. Because they used false witnesses. They hired false witnesses against Stephen to put him out of circulation. And it says in chapter 6, verse 15, this is, by the way, where I got the title for this message. All who were sitting at the Sanhedrin, or all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin, looking intently at Stephen, and they saw his face was like the face of an angel. The Sanhedrin court in Jerusalem was how the Romans allowed the Jews to govern themselves. The Romans, as long as there was not an uprising, they were charged to keep the peace. But they didn't understand Jewish ways, so this Sanhedrin court was made up of half Sadducees and half Pharisees, and they were the ones that governed the local things that took place in the Jewish community. They had their own police department, they had their own spies, and they were very, very powerful. This is the same group that falsely charged and crucified Jesus. This is the same group that ignored the fact that John the Baptist had been in the prison of Herod and had his head cut off and they did nothing. This is a Sanhedrin. But Stephen on that day, he has this dazzling appearance like Moses when he came down from the mountain. That glowed because he had been 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God behind the veil of the cloud. He glowed with Jesus. But one of the things that Stephen does is he begins to relay Israelite history. Even though he's Greek-speaking uh, Christian, he also is a Jew with, a, with a, an understanding of Jewish history. He knows about Abraham. He knows about Moses. He knows about um, Joseph in, in, in prison. He knows about everything that happened in Egypt. But just like a sculptor or a surgeon cuts away, his diagnosis is based upon the fact these people are stiff-necked. Now, stiff-necked, what that means is you're stubborn. They were stubborn. They were stubborn in their ways. They were stubborn in their laws. They were stubborn in how they did things, how they looked at life, and how they wanted everybody else to behave. This is the same group, like I said, they were guilty of John the Baptist's blood. They did nothing. They crucified Jesus, and he says, you continue to resist the Holy Spirit and all the prophets that have been sent to you trying to keep you from judgment. Now, when you deny God, that's a big deal. When you turn your back on Jesus and crucify him, that's a big deal. But when you deny the Holy Spirit, That's the end of your hope. The Holy Spirit is what convicts us and says, you need to be saved. To look at that and say, no, I don't need that. I don't need that. This is not true. The very basis for salvation. Anyway, when, when he began to diagnose them, 
Something happened in their hearts. See, back in Acts chapter 2, it says, when the people heard the preaching of Jesus, it says they were cut to the heart. And they said, what shall we do? And Peter responded, repent, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. This group, the the Sanhedrin, it says they were cut to the heart. But instead of responding like the people that heard Peter, they were enraged. It says they gnashed their teeth. Imagine a Doberman pincer. And you're in his domain. And he's been trained to eat anything in his side of the fence. And there you are. And he's barring his teeth. He's getting ready to lunch. And that's when, that's when Stephen sees it and he speaks of what he says. Look at 7 verse 56. He's just, he's just confessing what he sees. Look, he says, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's his connection. That's what he had when he had this look of composure. Looking like an angel. He saw Jesus. And these hearers in the Sanhedrin could not stand it. It says they stopped up their ears. They ran him out of the city and they began to stone him to death. And with his dying prayer, he prayed, let not this sin be held against them, just like Jesus. This morning, what we need as God's children is to remember that old hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. You soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. For victory under victory, his army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. What we need today is to allow our lives to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that we have a backbone. Doesn't mean we become anti-government. Bible reminds us we need to obey the governing authorities, that those that exist are from God. It's just they should not, they will not mess with the name of Jesus, which is the very name that saves us. And when they go against that, They've crossed the line. We will not back down from. Here's what I know. Arrests, when the church does what it's supposed to, are probably going to be a reality. We don't plan them. We don't make it happen. We don't have an attitude. John Maxwell talks about the person that can wander around in a 40-acre field and find the beehive and kick it over in the name of Jesus and then complain that he got living for Jesus was just too hard. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the fact that arrests probably could happen. In fact, Jesus says in John 16, 2, those who arrest you are going to be thinking they're doing a favor for God. It can happen. But let's not worry. Let's not worry. 
Because Mark chapter 13, verse 11 reminds us, when they arrest you, when they put you in courts, when they put you before kings and all the officials, don't worry about what you're going to speak or what you're going to say. At that moment, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. What's important for us is to do what Stephen did in that day. He simply spoke what he saw. He spoke of his experience. How can you argue with another person's experience? Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 reminds us. We can communicate with grace seasoned with salt. To anyone. Communicate with grace, season with salt for everyone. And then we rest in the Lord, like Psalm 37 7 says, and wait patiently for Him. Then we need to be alert. We need to be alert. We need to watch for the backwash. You know what the backwash is? You know, the backwash is the back of your boat. When it goes through the water, it's how the water parts behind the back of the boat. The propeller pushes you forward, and it's, it's, it's the backwash that that begins to push away the water that you cut through the water. See, what was, what was cutting behind is all the things that are going to follow. Philip, we're going to talk about Philip next week. Saul of Tarsus in his conversion, we're going to talk about that. All the opposition, all the persecution that takes all these Christians that were held up in Jerusalem, they didn't want to leave because of all the excitement it's going to drive them everywhere across the Roman Empire. An infiltration of every single person across the Roman landscape. Until even Caesar understands something's going on. Jesus reminds us. He says, judgment, I have come into this world. To those who claim to be seeing, become blind. And those who are blind will be able to see. It never fails. Not, now, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn anybody. But the salvation that he brings is what divides people. What we do with the name of Jesus makes a difference. If we say, I see clearly, I got this going for me, I got this church that I belong to, I got this civic club I belong to, I do this and this and this and this, I got all this going for me. Those are the things that cause blindness, causes self-righteousness. We don't see ourselves as we really are. It's the blind. And when Jesus is given a ray of light that allows them to see. And that's what we need today. We're going to be singing a song of decision. What I know is this. We're living in a world where riding the fence will not happen much longer. Even in our country, we see the fence dissolving. People are going to have to take a stand for Jesus or not for Jesus. And that includes churches. Not, like I say, we can have the attitude and we, we can come across as a very bad witness for Jesus. But just living for Jesus... In the world, there very definitely 
if we're causing problems in Satan's domain, something's going to happen. Let's sing together. Even as we look at our lives, we think about the backwash, where we're headed, what Jesus calls us to do. What's at stake? Jesus reminds us we can forfeit, listen, we can forfeit our own soul. What would we give in exchange for our souls today? Let's sing together our song of decision. Think about what Stephen saw. Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. He has everything under control. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. We're singing our song of decision and getting ready for communion. They had a good lesson.